I'm Pete Tong, and I've, uh, I'm here at Dove Spot. I, I fell in off the street. I was wandering down 14th Street, and it looked like the place to be. Welcome to the light of dawn. The shadow comes alive, don't turn around now. The travelers in time move on. I think the hardest, hardest thing is just holding on to that original, original idea you had. You know, just get it down. You know, everyone's got one good idea on them. <laughs> Some of us have got more. Just from a kid just wanting to be involved in music, I actually started out playing the drums. Literally one day at a school disco, I saw a DJ for the first time and I thought that's what I wanted to do. So I was DJing, I was like, I, was, I think I was working in a gas station, I was writing for a magazine, just doing everything I could to just be involved in music. If you wanted to get on DJing when I started in the late 70s, the only way was to be on the radio. I got lucky, I got invited by Radio 1 to start going up there every week and bringing them um, records to play that, that were from the underground back in the day. That gave me a kind of insane kind of level of experience because I was suddenly, I'd hardly done any radio at all and I was in, in at the biggest station in the country. Then I joined a record company in, in 1983, which was London Records. And um, a few years after I started there, they started sending me to New York. I would come over here and start licensing records. Hip hop was exploding. I was involved in signing Run DMC, Salt and Pepper, and I would hang out at BLS, the old one of the kind of most forward-thinking radio stations. I would sit in hotel rooms, like taping the radio. WBLS FM, the biggest beat in the biggest city. Learning about what they were doing with their jingles and everything like that, and how they were putting their mixes together. I, I went to Paradise Garage at that time, went to Dance Interior, so I was just soaking up all this stuff, taking it back to the UK and, and, and working with it. House music, no one really called it that at the start. It was just these new records that started appearing from Chicago. Signed a bunch of those records and we kind of packaged them up in the UK. And the first album was called The House Sound of Chicago, Volume 1. We had the whole rave scene in the UK at the end of the 80s. And that was kind of the real dividing line. It was like it was the end of an era and the start of a new era. And somehow I managed to be one of the only guys that was around before <laughs> that was still allowed to be around afterwards. Because like in rock and roll terms, it was like a punk rock moment. And almost everything that had gone before didn't exist anymore. And it was like the clock was um, reset and that was the year zero. You know, obviously house music came from, from America, electronic music, you know, strongly influenced from Germany. But it was, the, it was really in the UK where kind of, I think the club culture that you know today, prevalent over all, the world over, was really invented, cooked up, you know, developed in the UK at that time. It's a totally different time now. I mean, then, then it was, um, you know, the record companies were the gatekeepers, really. They, they were the enablers. You couldn't conceive making a record unless you had the backing of a record company or the access to a studio. Everything was very expensive, everything was very elitist, everything was difficult. And, and now, obviously, it's completely the opposite. You can make a track on your phone. You can release it yourself and you don't need a record company. The, the kind of role of a record company now is almost the end of the process as opposed to the beginning. Whilst the um, file sharing kind of undermined the business aspect of, of, of running a label, you know, the internet opened up the world to DJs. It was the first time really, I would say, where people all started dancing to the same tune. I did the transition like a lot of people have done. Vinyl was heavy. Um, the sleeves were beautiful, but CDs came along, and the first thing about CDs was simply the ease of traveling. And then I started looking at Serato as being the first kind of notion of having a laptop in the booth. You know, it was bad enough going from vinyl to CDs, but going from CDs to having a laptop in the booth was just like... <laughs> it was highly controversial. You know, you just get haters down the front saying, you know, you're not DJing. 
So I got bored quite quickly and then started looking at Ableton. So Ableton was good fun for a while, but it was so labour intensive. You know, so much preparation involved and I've always been a DJ that thrives on spontaneity. So I hate the idea of, here's your set list, go and play it in that order. I had to move on to something else and, that, and that's when I discovered Tractor and that's what I've been on ever since. When you've spent, you know, the best part of 25 years mixing records together, the taboo of the computer syncing it for you, to me, is not an issue. It's just a whole different level of creativity. Starting DJing from vinyl, all of us were A to B DJs. You played a record, you mixed the next one in, you, you took people on the journey like that. Because at the start with Tractor, you know, I defy anyone to say any different. You do the same thing. <laughs> you know, you're playing in lines. It's taken me probably four or five years to really get my head around how expansive it can be. I was a late starter in production because when I started it wasn't easy to do. I wasn't a musician as such. What I've settled on is a combination of Ableton and, and Logic together. Ableton really for just getting ideas on the fly. Logic to kind of map them out. I'll start loads of ideas and then I'll never finish them. Give you a good example, I stayed in the studio one night because I'm traveling so much, I hardly ever find myself in my studio on my own. And about a year ago, I was, I was in there one night and just came up with this chord progression and ended up getting SYF from Azari and Third to collaborate on it with me. And you know, now every, you know, it's been one of the biggest tracks of the summer in Ibiza and now it's coming out and defected like next month. And it's like, wow, just that little bit of extra effort has actually, it, it meant something. Hi. That's the biggest lesson I've learned in life, probably. Of the whole journey I've taken from the very first day I played a record in front of a crowd to, to last night, is that just, just be true to yourself, to be honest. It's the hardest thing to do, I think. It's always a level of responsibility that you've got to you know, entertain a crowd and you're, you know, you're being paid, you are the entertainer. Throw away all this technology, um, throw everything away, because ultimately it is about taste, it's about picking the right music and playing them in the right order. You can never be educated enough, or however you can do it, you know, man manuals are boring basically, so um, yeah, go online, consume videos, there's millions and millions of things on YouTube, and obviously what you, you guys are doing um, is incredible. In the 90s, if you had asked the Chemical Brothers, Prodigy, Orbital, they're all self-taught, but now everybody I speak to, they've all been to school. They've either taken courses at their own school or colleges or higher education or have come to Dubspot. I'm doing the infomercial now for Dubspot. This place is really good. <laughs>